Hello and welcome. In this video I will discuss an alternative deck archetype classification system that aims to define a deck on two axes, resource management and resource acquisition. Before we get into that, I would like to thank community member Natix who encouraged me to share more on this model. I would also like to thank this model's foremost authority and creator, Odd Tuner. I first came across the model in question while browsing various pages of CDH content sometime last year. The original model proposed by Odd Tuner first appeared on the now non-existent website Playing With Courage, where the initial Arthur penned various compelling pieces about CEDH theory, such as a checklist of what makes a commander CEDH viable and comprehensive discussion on CEDH deck concepts. Unfortunately, much of what the original Arthur wrote is now lost. Some fragments persist thanks to Internet Archive websites like the Wayback Machine. What I have presented in my JVP primer is what I have been able to piece together from what remains available. My attempts to track down Odd were unsuccessful, leading me only to a blank Moxfield account page. Odd Tuner, if you are out there, I am sure people would love to hear more about your thoughts on CEDH. Brewers within the CDH base commonly classify their decks using a simplistic heuristic that states what kind of strategy they are pursuing. These categories include stacks, mid-range, and turbo. Using this terminology, a brewer can clarify the speed at which a deck is supposed to be played. To elucidate, a stack deck aims to deny resources to its opponents by attacking critical gameplay rules. For example, the number of spells per turn, negating the untapping of permanents, or modifying the converted mana cost of spells. Due to the kind of cards that stack decks typically play, they usually shoot for a late game win. A turbo deck aims to produce a win as quickly as possible by using cards that synergize and focus on a specific game plan to maximize consistency. An example of a deck such as this is Cody Verocious Codex. Turbo decks prefer to win games within the first few turns. Finally, mid-range decks are those whose strategy is based on being able to shift from winning the game early to grinding value into the mid and late game. A typical example of this kind of deck is the partner pairing of Timna the Weaver and Thrasios Triton Hero. Mid-range decks will go for early or late wins depending on pod composition. While effective in giving a glimpse into a deck's approach, this three-speed classification system fails to describe the strategic goals a deck wishes to accomplish on a macro scale. This macro scale is how it interacts with the resource generation of other players and the speed it generates those resources. In contrast, the 3x3 model offers greater clarity on the macro level of a deck. Before discussing the 3x3 model, we need to define what resources are within Commander. By outlining what resources are, we can better understand what the 3x3 model is seeking to describe. Resources can be loosely defined as a stock or supply of an asset. In Commander, resources can be categorized in two ways. Tangible resources that relate to the mechanics of the game, and abstract resources that exist outside of the game's mechanics, but are the result of using tangible resources. Tangible resources include life, mana, permanents in play, and cards in various zones such as libraries, graveyards, hands, the command zone, and exile. Tangible resources are used to advance a deck's game plan, which may include the creation of abstract resources. Tangible resources can also result in things that are not resources but work to improve current tangible resources such as card draw, card selection, mana filtering, life gain, etc. Unlike tangible resources, abstract resources do not exist within the game's mechanics but are created because of utilizing tangible resources. Abstract resources include things such as tempo and information. Tempo refers to the idea of time whereas information relates to things such as revealed intelligence about opponents' cards in various zones. For example, a turn one play that sees a player playing a land, a soul ring, and a null rod generates little tangible resources. Still, it generates an X number of abstract resources in terms of time to develop more tangible or abstract resources further. Similarly, cards that allow you to examine the hidden zones of other players such as Gitaxian Probe or Opposition Agent, give you revealed information on an opponent's ability to generate tangible resources, their current ability to execute a game plan, their ability to interact with other game plans, and in the case of Opposition Agent, what that game plan actually is. In terms of limitations, it was suggested by a community member that I include some examples of where a deck 
may not fit into the model. Overall, this classification system is designed to embody all the approaches and how a deck manages resources, not the kind of resources a deck utilizes. For example, under the 3x3 model, it is possible to have a deck that would be classified as stacks under the 3 speed model that explosively accumulates resources to disrupt the board, as highlighted in the Null Rod example. Commander and Magic in general is a game of resources. Every deck will have an approach to resource management, which is what the 3x3 aims to define. The principal advantage of the 3x3 model is its specificity in detailing how a player interacts with resources while providing a macro level explanation of a deck's objective. As EDH is essentially a game of resources, applying this model to how one classifies decks over the traditional 3-speed model offers greater consistency in one's approach to deck building and commander selection by providing the blueprint for a deck's strategy for resource management. Furthermore, the 3x3 model can help understand the relationship between a commander and CDH as a meta and how a commander seeks to position itself within a specific pod. The 3x3 model aligns itself along two ideas rows and columns. Rows define how a deck manages resources, while columns define the speed at which a deck acquires resources. Let's take a look at both. Rows, which is how a deck manages resources, are broken up into three categories, proactive, adaptive, and disruptive. Proactive decks focus on developing their resources rather than denying the resources of others. Adaptive decks take a greater consideration on oscillating between developing resources and disrupting them. A disruptive deck is one that seeks to disrupt the resource generation of other decks. For columns, which is the speed a deck generates resources, there are also three classifications. Explosive, compound, and long-term. Explosive decks are those that seek to accumulate resources as quickly as possible. Compound decks are those decks that follow two phases of resource accumulation. Phase one sees the deck accumulating resources at a steady rate and then follows that with a second phase of rapid accumulation to fuel a win or a payoff. Long-term decks are those that value and use resilient resource engines that scale with the duration of a game. As a working example to demonstrate the usage of the 3x3 model, I will use the JVP list in the description of this video. When looking at how JVP manages resources, designated by row, he fits best into the adaptive classification. As a mono blue commander, Jace does not have the card pool available to focus on proactively developing its resources. In terms of resources that JVP can develop, it will be in the form of lands, mana rocks, and the occasional enchantment. Because of the lack of quality in the kinds of permanent based resources that JVP can play, the deck assumes the role of developing what it can while denying critical resources from other players. For our columns, Jace best aligns himself as a compound deck. Again, JVP's mono blue identity means that the consistency for fast explosiveness and gaining resources with a payoff is practically non-existent. Similarly, JVP does not have the card pool to consistently establish resilient resource engines that will keep it performing into the late game. While the deck does run cards like Ristic Study and Mystic Remora, Mono Blue largely lacks the kinds of cards that would enable a long-term strategy that would scale well, with the exception of perhaps Urza. In some cases, the deck won't mind going to the late game, but it does not perform as well as a deck whose strategy is to guarantee the late game with engines that scale. Within the 3x3 model, JVP best identifies as a Type 5 deck, Adaptive Compound. Under the 3 speed model, JVP best fits the mid-range classification. But what the 3 speed system does not describe is how JVP aims to manage resources throughout the course of a game. Unlike many higher color mid-range decks, JVP does not have the luxury of staple value sources. To say that JVP is a mid-range deck does nothing more than to say it positions itself as a deck that can win early, but can grind into the mid and late game. In a way, the 3x3 model expands the 3 speed model by establishing degrees of mid-range. Similarly, it also does this for the turbo and stack strategies. This leads us to another advantage of the 3x3 model. It allows us to change our resource management strategy without misrepresenting how we are managing resources. In the JVP example, we conclude that this list fits a type 5 strategy. With some adjustments to the list, JVP could transition into a type 8 deck, which is a disruptive compound deck, and it would do this by placing 
more significant consideration on disrupting other players' resources rather than generating it. By running more cards like Back to Basics and Counterbalance, we would still be able to steadily accumulate resources for a Phage 2 explosion and payoff. Under the 3 speed model, we would not be able to fit a Type 8 JVP into any of its speeds, as a mid range deck places much less consideration on disrupting opponents. To provide a more mainstream example of the usage of the 3x3 model, let us now look at Winota Joiner Forces. For this example, I will be looking at the Snowball Stacks list from the deck database. Winota's approach to resource management and generation is one that I have been thinking about since my exposure to the 3x3 model. Specifically, I have wondered how accurate it is to call Winota a stacks deck since I discovered the model. The deck does run quite a few classic stacks cards, such as Rule of Law effects and Tax effects, and when you compare it to other decks who self-describe as stacks, it runs about as many cards that are considered stacks cards. But how well does that word stacks describe the resource management and speed of Winota? The answer to that question is not very well. While the term stacks does describe the attacking aspect of resource management, it does not fully explain how the deck prioritizes the management of its resources, nor the speed at which the deck acquires resources, which is one of the key differences between the 3-speed model and the 3x3 model. In a way, calling Winota a stacks deck is a bit of a misnomer. Now, depending on how a brewer chooses to describe their deck, they may use words in tangent with turbo, midrange, and stacks to explain how a deck plays concerning resources without even realizing it. For example, the sample Winota list uses words like explosive, combo, disruptive, and pivot. Many of these words can be synonymous with parts of the 3x3 model. Rather than describing the deck as stacks, we could better describe the deck in a way that incorporates the elements of the speed of resource acquisition and the style of resource management. This will in turn better inform players how the deck aims to execute its game plan, or disrupt their own game plan. Using the 3x3 model, Winota's resource management and generation approach fits nicely into the Type 5 archetype, Adaptive Compound. To begin exploring this deck, let us break it down by the rows and columns. The speed of the deck sees it generating resources in the form of non-human creatures steadily to then use Winota to pay off with a rapid accumulation of human-type creatures, all of which provide a stacks effect to impact the resources of other players, tutor towards win conditions or more stacks pieces, or present a decisive win. In my personal experience, many players will opt to scoop depending on what is flipped. The speed at which Winota does this is perfectly described by the compound approach in which there is a phase 1 of steady resource accumulation and then a phase 2 of rapid expansion that leads to a win or payoff. In the case of Winota, the payoff is often a lockdown board state. A significant strength of Winota is its ability to switch between resource development and resource disruption depending on its needs. In some cases, the cards that the deck plays act to fill both roles of development and disruption for example, Archon of Emeria. Depending on pod composition, the deck can focus on developing its resources if playing against decks of similar or slower speeds or switch focus to disrupting resources of other decks that play faster. Munota, unlike a dedicated stacks list or other decks aligned along the disruptive row on the 3x3 model, is not locked in to the primary resource management strategy being the disruption of other players. Similarly, the deck is not close to ignoring other players to proactively put resources on the board. When able, Winota can play an innocuous non-human that is not worth interacting with on its own to develop towards its phase 2 explosion while also being able to switch between disruption and proactive generation of resources. This ability to switch between the two is what gives Winota the adaptive classification. At face value, one may assume that Winota is just a stacks list that seeks to take the game late through stacks pieces. However, our discussion of the sample list further highlights the limitations of the three-speed model. If we use the three-speed model, Winota does not fit into the turbo speed and somewhat matches the strategy of a mid-range deck while also utilizing the stacks method of resource denial. Because the three-speed model only describes one aspect of resources, it cannot adequately describe a deck's game plan. For our two examples, we looked at two type 5 decks, which are adaptive compound. While both decks similarly fit onto the 3x3 model in terms of speed of resource generation and management strategy of resources, the methods used to execute their phase 2 and disrupt opponents are entirely different. 
whereas JVP develops its resources chiefly with lands, artifacts, and the occasional creature, Winota leans much more heavily on creatures. When seeking to disrupt opponents, JVP does so through counter magic, on the stack interaction, and the occasional enchantment. Conversely, Winota's disruption methods are primarily in the form of a robust creature package with the occasional artifact, enchantment, or on the stack spell. If we move away from the three speed model, JVP ceases to be just a mid range deck, while Winota ceases to just be a stacks deck. Instead of classifying these decks on one aspect, often vaguely so, we should instead classify them concerning the speed a deck generates resources and the resource management method. Overall, the 3x3 model of classification allows brewers and pilots to understand better how their resources and approach to managing resources interact with not only their commander and strategy, but with the strategy of others. While the three-speed model does have its limitations in describing aspects of a deck's economy, parts of it can still be helpful in defining the method a deck uses to approach its economy. Using our Winota example, we could say something like this. Winota is an adaptive compound deck that uses stacks as its method of disruption while using non-human creatures in tangent with its commander to progress its game plan. If you're interested in reading more of Odd Tuner's work, I will link to what remains in the description of this video. Thank you for your time and interest in this topic.